chapter four of concerning isabel carnaby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org concerning isabel carnaby by ellen thornycroft fowler chapter four friends in need through whatsoever ills be tied for you i will be spent and spend i'll stand for ever by your side and naught shall you and me divide because you are my friend perhaps one of the most noteworthy characteristics of the people called methodists is the esprit du corps the spirit of clannishness which runs through the whole body is any sick the rest are eager to pray is any merry the rest are delighted to sing psalms and they will not only pray and sing in sympathy which is comparatively easy but they are ready to spend and to be spent for the brethren to any extent men may know that they are methodists from the love they have one to another and this love does not confine itself to the actual members of the church but extends to their descendants to the third and fourth generation even though these descendants may have forsaken the faith of their fathers and embraced other forms of worship this clannishness is not so much the spiritual bond of a common creed as a more human and so more indissoluble bond like the tie of country or of kinship and therefore no variations in belief can break it if the children of methodism as they grow up and see the various phases of modern life incline to a broader faith or a more ornate ritual than those which satisfied their fathers their mother church does not blame them as perverts nor brand them as apostates they are still her children and she will be interested in them to the end though the daughter may forget her own people and her father's house she herself is ever remembered in the old home where there is no bitterness on account of her forgetfulness such forgetfulness being but the fulfilment of a law of natural growth it is this spirit of kinship that accounts for the wonderful freemasonry among all wesleyan methodists and their masonic sign their shibboleth so to speak is their pronunciation of their denominational name if a man pronounces the word wesleyan as if the s were a z and puts the accent upon the second syllable one may safely conclude that that man has never been inside this particular fold but if he sounds the s sharply as if it were double s and accentuates the first syllable of the word all wesleyans know that he is or his father was before him one of themselves for his speech bewrayeth him when paul had been at oxford for upwards of two years and seemed on the high road to success in all his undertakings a sudden change came o'er the spirit of his dream the bank in which mrs seaton's fortune was invested stopped payment and the heavy calls which her husband was obliged to pay left him with but a very small addition to his income as a supernumerary to many men of his age this would have been a crushing blow but mark seaton's mind was so uniformly set upon things above and so indifferent to all earthly considerations that worldly misfortunes had little power to hurt him but the stroke nevertheless fell heavily upon his wife not that she was more worldly-minded than her husband but because poverty always presses harder upon a woman than upon a man poverty meets a man face to face upon the battlefield of life and he then and there either conquers or is conquered by it but it waylays a woman in her home lurking for her in the recesses of her wardrobe and jumping out upon her from her kitchen and her storeroom and a secret foe is always worse than an open enemy the blow fell when paul was down for the long vacation and he saw far more clearly than his father did what it would mean to his mother and sister with an intuition which was rare in so young a man he realized how the daily struggle to make both ends meet which hardly penetrated into the minister's study would embitter joanna's youth and render mrs seaton's declining years 
but labour and sorrow to her and with his accustomed decision he made up his mind that this burden must be lightened at all costs even though the lightning taxed him to his uttermost farthing joanna he said one day when he and his sister were alone together i am not going back to oxford not going back to oxford paul what do you mean simply what i say instead of finishing my time there i have decided to set about earning something at once so as to make life a little less hard for you and mother but there is no need for that said joanna mother and i were saying only yesterday what a good thing it was that you had your scholarship and so were independent of us that's all rot said paul a fellow can't be independent of his own people in that sense and i'm not going to have mother fagged to death over things if i can stop it but paul it would spoil your career if you left oxford without taking your degree don't bother about that and besides career or no career my mind is made up don't you know urged joanna that father and mother and i would gladly give up everything we have for the sake of you and your future of course i do and do you suppose i haven't the same consideration for you but paul it seems such a shame it's no use arguing with me i've made up my mind i tell you of course i'm sorry to leave oxford and throw up my chance of a first and all that that means but you know there are some things a fellow can pay too dearly for and that is one of them joanna's eyes filled with tears oh paul are you sure it is necessary look here i think it is necessary that i should set about earning some money as soon as possible it is awfully good of you dear oh i don't know much about the goodness of it but i do know that a man couldn't very well act differently under the circumstances but paul think of your boating and how you would miss that for the first time in the conversation paul's lip quivered please don't let's talk about that besides boating isn't everything after a few moments joanna asked then what shall you do instead of going back to oxford i shall go and teach small latin and less greek to sir richard s dale's son i wrote to my tutor telling him how matters stood and asking him if he could put me in the way of getting a job and he wrote back saying that old s dale who is a chum of his wanted somebody to teach his small boy and prepare him for eton and so he recommended you he said he should be pleased to recommend me to anybody as i took a first in mods and was pretty sure to do the same in greats if i had stayed up so i shall go to esdale court after the summer holidays are over i see the pay is two hundred a year continued paul and i can send most of it home as i shall have only my clothes to pay for oh paul how good you are you see even if i stayed on at oxford and took my degree and went to the bar it would be ages before i could earn anything and i feel i mustn't waste any more time but i shall write articles and things for magazines in the intervals of teaching young esdale his a b c and i hope in time to make a good thing out of my pen but do you think you will like teaching asked joanna i can't say anything about that at present just now my idea of teaching anybody anything is to say it over and over again in the same words but louder and louder each time with the addition of a few epithets hurled at the stupidity of the pupil but i dare say i shall warm to the work in time and as what must be must be there is no good talking any more about it so paul seaton renounced his heart's desire and gave up his youthful dreams it was no light matter to him thus to forego all the things that he had longed for from his youth up but he was hopeful enough to believe that if a man can succeed in anything he can succeed in everything and that success is a matter of character rather than a question of circumstance therefore paul made up his mind that if he could not distinguish himself in law he would distinguish himself in letters and would be a great author as he might not be a great advocate and in the meantime he worked and waited and did all in his power to lighten the cloud which had fallen upon the little home at chaford and things pressed heavily there at first before paul's salary had begun to come in and before the necessary retrenchments had been put into practice for one cannot reconstruct the management of a household in a day but it was better for the seatons than it might otherwise have been because of that wonderful methodist 
freemasonry my husband and i want to know said mrs ford to the minister one day if instead of renting another house as you intend you will do us the favour of living in our little cottage we do not need it as long as our son remains unmarried and we should not like to let it as chayford cottage has never been let so it really will be a kindness to us if you and mrs seaton will keep it warm for us till such time as we want it for edgar and his wife the minister grasped her hand you are very good to us he said and his voice shook but i hardly like to take advantage of such generosity let me assure you that such a feeling is quite beside the mark it is really far better for a house to be inhabited by gentle people than by caretakers and yet i should not like to have any one living there with whom i was not on terms of the most intimate friendship so you are really conferring the favour on us mr seaton smiled there was once another great woman who builded a little chamber in the wall that a prophet might abide there and who was careful for him with all care and we do not read that the prophet's pride rebelled against the sense of obligation nor that he hesitated to take a favour at the great woman's hands because she happened to be rich and he was poor because when one gets to the heart of life and understands that nothing is one's own but that all things are god's there is no such thing as a sense of obligation such a sense as a mere vulgar superficiality said mrs ford precisely therefore dear mrs ford i accept your kind offer with more gratitude than i can express i can never repay you and your husband for what you have done for me and mine but like the prophet of old i can speak for you to the king and the captain of the host and believe me i shall do that every time i am on my knees and may god grant more abundantly than i can desire or conceive all the prayers that i shall offer up on your behalf so it was arranged that the seatons should take up their abode at chayford cottage thus they were saved from paying rent a heavy item in small homes but nevertheless the incidental expenses of moving and so forth were so great that mr seaton decided with much sorrow that he should be obliged to part with his library in order to meet them on hearing of this decision miss dalicott called at the minister's is it true dear mr seaton she began that you are contemplating the sale of your interesting and valuable library mrs ford informed me that she believed such was the case though she had no authority for making the statement beyond the sanction of rumour it is true i am grieved to say replied the minister i have always made it my rule in life to pay ready money for all things and never to run into debt even for a shilling's worth therefore i am in need of some cash in hand to pay the expenses of our move into the cottage my conscience would not allow me to borrow the necessary sum so i see no alternative but to dispose of my books still you possess so many friends who would feel it a privilege to advance the sum you require that it seems a matter of regret that you will not avail yourself of the loan do not tempt me dear miss dalicott to act against my principles i have made a vow to owe no man anything even for an hour and i should not feel it consistent with my profession as a minister of christ to run into debt on any pretext whatsoever then that being the case said miss drusilla you will not deem it unseemly or commercial on my part to inform you that i have long viewed with feelings of envy your admirably selected collection of old books i have come here to-day with the intention of making you a reasonable offer for the same but i felt that such an offer would savour of impertinence if your mind were not as yet finally made up in favour of disposing of your valuable library mr seaton looked pleased i am very glad to hear you say this i confess it is a wrench to me to part with my books and i cannot disguise from myself that i shall miss them sorely yet it is a great comfort to me to think that my carefully selected library will not be broken up but will be in the possession of a cultured person capable of appreciating it then said miss dalicott blushing may i be so mercenary as to mention the sum i should offer in exchange for your admirable collection of volumes certainly dear miss dalicott i am as you know a child in these matters and have no idea what my library is worth 
the sum i should suggest is five hundred pounds but if you think that insufficient pray tell me so and i will increase it at once nay miss drusilla that seems to me far too much i could not take such a large sum as that for my little library believe me dear mr seaton it is none too much said miss dalacott with more charity than veracity in fact i believe at a sale your books would command a far larger sum but as you remark it would be a source of regret to see so carefully selected a collection ruthlessly resolved again into its integral parts the minister looked doubtful i am a poor hand at business but i think you are too generous dear friend quite the reverse take my word for it mr seaton i am making what is vulgarly termed a bargain to obtain a valuable library which i have long coveted for the comparatively trifling sum of five hundred pounds is a stroke of good fortune such as does not generally fall to my portion mark seaton shook his head i trust that we are not deceiving ourselves and letting your kindness of heart run away with us certainly not have no doubts on that score i entreat you and now i have a favour to ask of you if you will not think me importunate in so doing by no means dear miss drusilla it will be the greatest pleasure to me to do anything in my power for so faithful a friend as you have proved yourself to be the request i have to make is that you will grant me permission to keep my library under your roof for a time as you will perceive i have no space at present for any increase in my shelf-room i may possibly add a small octagonal room to my present study like the one at chaford house but until this arrangement is carried out i must trespass on your kindness so far as to leave the library i have purchased from you in your keeping the minister's face glowed with innocent pleasure he had no suspicion of any guile on the good spinster's part and it rejoiced his heart to know that he and his beloved books would not be parted just yet i shall be only too delighted to oblige you in this matter miss dalacott in fact added he with the air of one imparting a new view of the question i myself shall profit by the arrangement for i am sure you will not have any objection to my using the books as long as they are in my charge of course not dear mr seaton i trust you will avail yourself of the library just the same whether it is nominally in my possession or in yours and it will be a source of unbounded satisfaction to me to feel that my treasured books are under such safe jurisdiction i hope that i have not acted in a deceitful manner said miss dalacott to herself on her way home but the worthy man would not have accepted help more openly bestowed i fear wherefore my little ruse was perhaps excusable and i was not actually guilty of any untruth at least i trust i was not surely the value of anything is what it happens to be worth to us and the minister's library is worth far more than five hundred pounds to me for it represents the earthly happiness of my dear friend and pastor and it is undoubtedly true that i have no more book-room in my little home my shelves are already so overcrowded that a new hymn-book would prove a superfluity to me at present but i fear i overstepped the mark a little in my speech and anent the octagonal enlargement i have no actual intention of ever enlarging my borders and i am sorely afraid i conveyed the impression that such an intention formed part of my immediate programme i trust that i have not sinned in this and done evil that good may come and the good lady sighed in much contrition of spirit never having read how the recording angel blots out with a tear some entries even as he makes them but the entry against miss drusilla was not the only erasure that the recording angel had to make that day martha said mrs seaton to her faithful handmaiden it goes to my heart to say it but i fear we cannot keep you with us any longer well to be sure ma'am exclaimed martha in unfeigned surprise and what may have put such a notion as that into your head you'll be talking about giving the minister notice next the fact is martha that we can no longer afford so valuable a maid as yourself now that our circumstances are changed we can only keep one servant for the very rough work and miss joanna and i must do the rest ourselves 
well i am glad to hear that it is the money question that has put you thus beside yourself ma'am and not any dissatisfaction with me not that i should have left even if such had been the case i should have stayed with you for your own good even though you had given me notice twenty times a day bless you ma'am if i wasn't here to look after you all the whole place would go to rack and ruin you are right martha home would not be home without you then don't multiply words any more ma'am or talk nonsense about my going away i have made up my mind to stay on with you all and not to take any wages whatsoever and when martha prosser puts her foot down all the king's horses and all the king's men can't pick it up again but dear martha we can't let you go on serving us without wages and why not i should like to know what do i want with wages my face is too plain for me to care to spend money on my back which is no secret being there for all the world to see and i don't hold with saving ma'am money is like the manna to my thinking it is all very well to supply the needs of the passing day but when you begin to save it up it doesn't improve with keeping yet we should all of us lay by what we can for our old age suggested mrs seaton i don't hold with that neither it is a poor compliment to my mind to say the lord will provide and then to bolster him up with a bank-book as if he couldn't do his part of the business without our assistance my conscience alive if we'll only do our part properly he'll do his never fear the minister's wife did not reply in words but she threw her arms round martha's neck and sobbed out her griefs and her gratitude on that faithful breast as for martha when she had soothed and comforted her mistress she armed herself with the wisdom of the serpent and knocked at the door of the minister's study if you please sir she said in a sepulchral tone i want to consult you about a spiritual difficulty certainly martha certainly replied mr seaton with much warmth feeling far more at home on eternal than on temporal ground sit down and tell me all about it and i will see how i can help you thus adjured martha took a seat i used to think she began that when one had got to a sensible age one would have outgrown the snares and wiles of the devil but bless my soul he has got them suited to fit all ages and sizes as they say of ready-made clothes he has indeed my poor martha and it is when we think he has no longer the power to harm us that he is most to be dreaded but tell me what is the temptation that has been assailing you now martha's face was the picture of gloom as she replied i feel that covetousness and the love of money are creeping upon me in my old age and we all know that the lord hateth the covetous man and that the love of money is the root of all evil mr seaton's face was very tender as he answered i fancy that you are unduly distressing yourself surely i who know you so well and with whom you have met in class all these years should have perceived this fault in your character had it ever existed believe me your conscience is oversensitive and now falsely accuses you but martha shook her head the heart knoweth its own bitterness she replied and i want you to help me to conquer the devil and not explain him away as my aunt matilda jane said when the doctor told her she had nasal catarrh it is a common cold in the head and i haven't sent for you to christen it but to cure it that is what aunt matilda jane said and she had right on her side to my thinking well martha if as you say the sin of covetousness is lying in wait for your soul i can only pray for you and entreat you to watch as well as pray that you enter not into this temptation that is not enough there is more than prayer wanted in my case not that prayer is not sufficient for some and i should be the last to say a word against it but i want something more myself replied the penitent then tell me what that more is demanded martha's spiritual adviser in some perplexity i want you to remove the temptation far from me so that i can no longer behold the accursed thing in fact i want you to take all my savings and spend them and never let me hear of them again they being but filthy lucre at best and amounting to one hundred and eleven pounds fifteen shillings and sixpence in all added the excited martha thrusting her bank-book into her master's hand if i keep them they may draw my soul into perdition and make me as them that have their portion in this life 
well if you'll only take and spend them you'll save my soul alive and be able to have a fire in your bedroom all the winter which the mistress ought never to be without her being so rheumatic bless her dear heart then at last the minister understood and he also understood that when any pilgrim's face is set as though to go to jerusalem it is no sign of true apostleship to try to turn that pilgrim back so he took martha's bank-book into his keeping until such time as he saw fit to return it to her thank you martha he said and his eyes were full of tears i will do as you bid me and shall be able to see that your dear mistress lacks nothing during the coming winter owing to your generosity and you in your turn will always remember that in this household as in the early church we have all things in common and that whatever is ours is also yours then that's settled replied martha cheerfully and now i must go back to the kitchen to see the oven which is apt to burn the pie crust without baking it unless duly warned and admonished by them that have authority you'd wonder how an oven could burn without baking but human nature is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked and our kitchen oven is one of the worst yet martha god is very good and therefore human nature is sometimes very good likewise i have certainly proved it of late well you see sir it is in this way expounded martha god made man in his own image and though man spoils himself in the making and loses his proper pattern and falls out of shape the original mould is not broken yet nor never will be trust the lord for that End of chapter 4chapter five of concerning isabel carnaby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org concerning isabel carnaby by ellen thornycroft fowler chapter five water lilies i will crown you as my queen by my soul's subjection for you all your life have been what i think perfection paul felt leaving oxford more than he would have cared to confess and the weeks he spent at home would have been a dreary time had they not been brightened by the smiles and the sympathy of alice martin to paul's vigorous and energetic nature alice was very soothing and restful it was true that she did not understand more than half of what he said to her but she listened to it all which was nearly as good and a girl could not be expected to enter into a man's thoughts and feelings paul said to himself not having yet graduated in cupid's university and paul came very near to loving alice in those days with the sort of comfortable commonplace everyday love which satisfies ninety-nine men and one woman out of every hundred but paul unfortunately happened to be the one and alice one of the ninety-nine so there was not much chance of their making one another happy one day in the summer in which paul left oxford he and joanna with edgar ford and alice martin went for a picnic to chaford wood edgar had ceased to make himself disagreeable to alice no man being able to perform the impossible for too long a time at a stretch and alice sunned herself in his reawakened smiles not even her love for paul having the power to stamp out her desire for universal popularity as they were sitting by the lake alice remarked isn't it funny how a lovely scene like this makes one feel good and happy and yet sad with longing for something that one has never heard of i am never sad with longing for what i never heard of replied joanna whenever i feel sad i always know it means that i want to see mrs crozier again are you still very devoted to mrs crozier inquired alice of course i am i'd do anything in the world for her anything wrong or foolish do you mean asked edgar certainly not she'd never want me to do anything wrong or foolish that is not the question said edgar who greatly loved to tease joanna would you if she did but she wouldn't would you do anything wrong or foolish for any one you cared much for inquired joanna turning the tables on her adversary edgar thought for a moment anything wrong no anything foolish yes he answered 
i was reading a poem the other day said alice about a lady who threw her glove into the lion's den to test her lover's affection he jumped into the den and rescued the glove only to fling it into the lady's face i cannot make up my mind whether he was right or not most certainly he was replied paul in his highly superior manner to make an exhibition of so sacred a thing as a man's love proved the woman to be vain and frivolous and incapable of seeing the deeper thing therefore the man was better without her than with her and he did well to throw her over there is nothing so revolting to a man as frivolity in a woman when deep calleth unto deep love reaches perfection when shallow calleth unto shallow there is not much harm done but when deep calleth unto shallow the tragedies of life begin i am not sure that the lady was so frivolous said edgar thoughtfully probably she was sick to death of the adulation of empty-headed and empty-hearted courtiers and wanted to prove to herself and to the assembled court that this particular knight really cared for her in which case the deep called unto shallow indeed but the lady was the deep and the knight the shallow i do not agree with you at all answered paul rather hotly she was vain and frivolous and wanted to make the other women jealous by showing off the devotion of her young man and i'd see a woman at jericho before i'd make an exhibition of my love for her to excite the envy of her rivals gently my young friend said edgar with his pleasant smile if you really loved a woman you'd give her your heart out and out and whether she cherished it or played with it would be her concern not yours but no nice woman would want to play with it remarked joanna i don't see that replied edgar even nice women have their little vanities and like to prove the extent of their power over men besides if one really loved a woman one would go on loving her just the same even if she did the things that one did not consider nice of course one would hate the things but that would make no difference in loving the woman oh yes it would cried paul i should leave off loving a woman at once if she did things that i did not approve of i don't say that it would not hurt at the time but the wrench of thrusting her out of my life then and there would not hurt half so much in the long run as letting her go on withering up my affections and knocking down my ideals in the former case i should lose her and keep myself in the latter i should lose both myself and her but my dear fellow you wouldn't bother about yourself you'd only know that you could not afford to lose the woman so you would rescue her glove from the lines and then button it for her not i i should teach her a lesson and then have done with her edgar laughed my good paul who wants to teach women lessons you talk as if they were schoolboys and you really are old enough to know better but do you mean to say edgar asked joanna that you would let any woman make a plaything or a doormat of you by all means if i loved her and she was so minded if i really cared for her you see i should think it the greatest honour to be elevated to the uses of her playthings and her doormats and i should count myself unworthy to be adapted to such purposes i call that unmanly remarked paul even if a man does love a woman he owes a duty to himself as well as to her edgar merely chuckled i see nothing to laugh at quoth paul severely i did not say anything humorous not intentionally murmured edgar it seems to me continued paul that a man is unfair to himself and to the woman when he grovels at her feet a sensible and equal affection is better for both of them o oh, noble judge o oh, excellent young man exclaimed edgar what i am saying is common sense added paul though you appear to think me harsh and unloving not harsh and unloving my dear paul merely foolish and ignorant replied edgar i cannot see the sense of throwing a glove among lines just for the sake of picking it up again said the sensible joanna it seems to me a most unnecessary and absurd action it would be nice to feel that a man liked you well enough to perform unnecessary and absurd actions for your sake added alice wistfully edgar looked at her but he said nothing he only understood 
it would not please me if men did absurd things for my sake persisted joanna it would only please me if they did good and noble things to win my regard joanna is quite right agreed joanna's brother approvingly vain women do men a lot of harm even if they like them suggested alice of course the more the men like them the more harm they do but the worst of women is continued paul that they are always wanting to see what will happen if they do certain things they make a man angry just to see what he looks like when he is angry and they make a man miserable just to see what he looks like when he is miserable and they never realize how much gratuitous suffering all this entails upon the man but they haven't the slightest idea how much it hurts said edgar they know that it is all a sort of histrionic performance or scientific experiment and they expect the man to treat the matter from the same intellectual standpoint while as for him poor beggar he only knows that he is being broken on the wheel and he cannot for the life of him see the object of it as you say now alice was a good girl as well as a pretty girl and amiable and unselfish into the bargain but she was not the reigning beauty of chaford for nothing and she now and again wanted like other queens to try on her regalia so she said in her sweet plaintive voice i should so like some of those water-lilies from the far side of the pool the said lilies grew under a steep and slippery bank which was the only approach to them there being no boat on chaford pool at this particular time both men looked across the pool and paul shook his head i'm afraid you can't have them he said till there is a boat on the water the bank is not really safe after the heavy rains we have had lately alice pouted but i want them now they will be all over by the time the boats are in use edgar looked at her do you really care very much about them he asked of course i do replied alice they are my favourite flowers and i want some dreadfully then you shall have some said edgar quietly walking off in the direction of the lilies round the end of the pool paul's brow grew very black don't be a fool edgar he cried roughly that bank really is not safe and a girl's whim is not worth the price of a wedding especially to a delicate fellow like you alice what are you thinking of tell him at once he is not to go but alice's usually equable temper was so ruffled by paul's brusqueness and she would not do as he bade her alice don't you hear what i am saying tell him that he is not to go repeated paul but alice's gentle spirit was so sore from the effect of paul's indifference to her that she shut her pretty mouth obstinately and would not interfere if paul is so horrid to me he shall see that other men admire me she said to herself and that will add to my importance in his eyes finding that alice was obdurate paul ran after edgar to endeavour to dissuade him from so foolhardy an attempt but before he reached him edgar was halfway down the slippery bank by keeping one foot on sea and one on shore and by grasping the overhanging bough of a birch tree edgar managed to gather a handful of the desired lilies but when he tried to return his shore foot slipped and he fell into the water by that time paul had overtaken his friend and was able to help edgar out of the pool and up the bank but not before the latter had suffered a thorough soaking which brought on a severe chill edgar was laid up for several days in consequence of his immersion in chaford pool during which time paul visited him constantly and alice as constantly sent him flowers and books and little scented notes for her tender heart was wrung with remorse for the consequences of her vanity edgar quite understood this remorse and accepted it for he knew alice better than paul did but remorse was not the particular thing he was wanting from her just then i say old fellow said paul to him one day i shall never like alice again after the scurvy trick she played you oh don't say that besought edgar bravely fighting alice's battle with paul though it was no easy task to him to do so it was only a little bit of feminine vanity on her part which ninety-nine pretty girls out of every hundred would have indulged in 
then deliver me from ninety-nine pretty girls out of every hundred prayed paul it really isn't fair to blame her old boy she had no idea there was any risk in the thing and she has been far more sorry for me and more kind to me than i deserve ever since oh i don't mean to say that she deliberately planned to make you ill nor do i deny that her penitence is sincere all i say is that the shallow vanity which induces a woman to expose a man to danger or even to discomfort to gratify a mere whim of hers is a thing which is simply revolting to me it is not that i cannot forgive her i could forgive far worse things than this if they had their origin in something deeper even if more dangerous than mere vanity i am not at war with her but i know and feel that i shall never like her again edgar puffed at his pipe in silence for some moments i used to think you cared for alice he said at last i used to think so too at one time answered paul slowly but i know now i was mistaken i liked her beauty and her pretty sympathetic manner and i found her very soothing when i was irritable and out of temper but there was always something which disappointed me in her she is charming and pleasant like a walled flower garden but there is no beyond in alice the woman i love must not only have a garden in the front of her character to gladden my eyes every day but there must also be glimpses of a view beyond of sunny lands of beulah and of mountains reaching up to heaven edgar smoked in silence there are three things which combine to produce love continued paul in his youthfully didactic way moral excellence intellectual companionship and physical charm of course if one can get the three in a line one is right for all time but generally one has to put up with only two i respected alice's character and i felt her charm but intellectually she and i were never comrades nevertheless i fancied that two conditions out of the three might prove enough after her conduct the other day however i saw that though sweet and amiable there was something small and paltry in her nature therefore she has now ceased to appeal to the second side of me and personal beauty alone is not sufficient to satisfy me in a wife so out of my future life alice goes then do you mean to say that as far as you are concerned another man has the right to try and win alice paul looked up in surprise of course why not you don't mean to say that you care for her but i do answered edgar with his quiet smile i have cared for her all her life and i shall continue to do so all mine but i stood on one side because i thought you loved her he was too chivalrous to say because i thought she loved you well go in and win old man cried paul grasping his friend's hand but don't you think that her action the other day was rather small and petty i think i would rather not discuss alice even with you my dear fellow you see i should knock down any man who dared to say a word against her and i should be sorry if that man happened to be yourself all right i beg your pardon all that i can say is that i think alice is the luckiest girl i know i'm afraid she won't think so why don't you think she cares for you inquired the unperceiving paul i am sure she doesn't worse luck for me well then she will soon learn to do so there is no doubt of that now that she has seen how much you care for her edgar smiled rather sadly i have succeeded in teaching her that there is no one in the world but her but i have not yet taught her that there is no one in the world but me she will soon learn it never fear with such a schoolmaster but poor edgar did not feel quite so sure and alice all the time was telling herself that since edgar loved her so much paul was certain to love her too an illogical argument perhaps but one most convincing to the normal female mind she did not know poor child that with her own hands she had shut the door of the eden which she coveted and that the hands which have power to shut have not necessarily the power to open again alas for us all that the gate of eden is so hard to seek and that so few succeed in finding it and those of us who are fortunate enough to discover it must take heed to our ways lest it close with a spring and open to us never again knock 
we never so loudly end of chapter five chapter six of concerning isabel carnaby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org concerning isabel carnaby by ellen thornycroft fowler chapter six s dale court their ways were ways of pleasant grace they toiled not neither did they spin but since their smiles made glad the place their men of sterner cast of face account such carelessness a sin it was on a sunny september afternoon that paul seaton first saw esdale court and the mellowed elizabethan house with its stately avenues and large lake was very pleasant to look upon in the autumn sunlight on his arrival he was ushered by a stout and pompous butler into the drawing-room where lady estale was taking tea with her son and daughter aged respectively nine and fourteen lady estale had been a great beauty in her day and at eight and thirty was still a lovely woman how do you do mr beaton she began how nice of you to come just in time for tea violet and dick are having tea with me to-day for a treat but they generally have it in the schoolroom don't you know come children this is mr beaton who is so kind as to come and teach dick violet who inherited her mother's beauty treated the new tutor to a supercilious little nod but dick a plain and wholesome little boy thrust a sticky and jam besprinkled palm into paul's outstretched hand i say said dick i've been out shooting with father to-day have you replied paul with polite interest i hope you have had good sport dick shook his little red head we had bad luck he said shocking bad luck only four brace and a couple of hairs all day but father let me carry the birds home and i got my clothes covered with blood he added more cheerfully as dick has been out all day and walked so far i am letting him have an egg with his tea said lady estale and he insists upon eating bread and jam with it i wish he wouldn't do you think it will make him ill i cannot say it is not a combination that would suit me but other times other manners you know lady estale what a fuss you make about a chap mother exclaimed dick with scorn i'm all right and feel as fit as a fiddle but it is enough to make a fellow sick to hear you talking so much about whether things are good for us or not very well darling but promise me you will leave off eating jam with your egg the minute you begin to feel not quite well and oh mr seabright i was forgetting all about you and you have had such a long journey and must want your tea dreadfully how stupid i am not at all the journey from chaford is quite a short one really only there are so many changes it makes it rather troublesome i know i hate changes don't you just when you've got your things all about the carriage and are settling yourself down to a nice book a horrid guard or porter or something comes shouting at you and makes you jump out of your carriage and leave half your things behind and my maid never will help at stations because she hates travelling and is offended with me every time i take her from home she says the train makes her giddy or something and you see i can't go without her because i couldn't do my own hair to save my life i suppose not said paul feeling very much amused by her ladyship's flow of conversation and there i have gone and forgotten your tea again how careless i am i am afraid this tea is not very fresh mr seabright in fact it has stood for over an hour but simmons that is the butler is so dreadfully offended if i send out for fresh tea to be made during the afternoon that i really dare not do it you won't mind much will you if it is rather strong and cold paul smiled and forsook the paths of rectitude so far as to assure her ladyship that tea on the lees was the beverage he fancied above all others oh how dear of you to say that and you can have as much hot water as you like though the hot water is cold too but it will take off the bitter taste which makes the special nastiness of old tea is it very bad now you come to drink it asked lady estale with sympathetic interest paul lied bravely it is delicious 
i am so glad it really is tiresome having a butler who takes offence if you ask him to do anything it must make life very difficult lady estale it does very difficult indeed i often don't get enough to eat because i daren't ask for more when simmons is carving but i make up with vegetables because the footmen hand them and i'm not afraid of a footman still vegetables without meat are very fattening don't you think and the dread of my life is to get fat i don't think that any woman looks well when she is fat do you i really don't know answered paul who had hitherto lived among women who cared for none of these things i am afraid i never thought about it how quaint of you but you are awfully clever you see and so never think about anything but books and sums and things now i am not a bit clever or learned or anything paul again wandered from the path of the upright by expressing polite surprise at this platitude have another cup of tea do begged lady estale if you don't i shall know you told a story about its not tasting as bad as we expected and paul was so charmed by her ladyship's beauty and good nature that he asked for another cup and swallowed the same without wincing nevertheless he possessed the spirit of a philanthropist so he remarked there is a sort of arrangement i've seen somewhere of putting the tea-leaves into a little bag and pouring the hot water over them then the leaves are removed so that however long the tea stands it never gets any stronger what a lovely idea and it would be such fun taking the tea-leaves out again while they were all wet it would make a jolly mess i bet agreed dick enthusiastically you'd always let me do it wouldn't you mother of course darling if you would promise to take care not to burn your fingers i'd make a fine splash all over the cloth chuckled dick what a dirty boy you are said violet reprovingly dick did not reply to his sister in words but he turned upon her such a wilfully contorted countenance that violet dissolved into laughter but i'm afraid simmons wouldn't approve of that arrangement sighed lady esdale he always sets his face against anything fresh i remember once sir richard bought a new kind of carving knife a patent masticator i think it was called or some such disgusting name and simmons said he would give notice rather than demean himself by using it he had carved for the family for thirty years he said and his own right hand had been enough all that time and would be till the end it wasn't true because he had always used a carving knife of some sort but simmons is quite poetical when he is excited what did sir richard do asked paul oh he roared with laughter and threw the thing behind the fire to tell the truth i believe richard is as much afraid of simmons as i am but he'd rather die than own it paul very soon settled down in his new quarters at esdale court he liked the place and the people the latter were so different from everything that he had been accustomed to that they completely fascinated him their wheels were all well oiled and so they took life easily and never seemed to look below the surface of things and yet they did their duty in the state of life to which they were called and they were high-minded and upright and well-bred and were careful to act honourably and charitably towards their neighbours and to go to the parish church regularly once every sunday they never talked about their hearts or their souls or their consciences but ate and drank and were merry and made the corner of the earth where their lot was cast a better place for their being in it sir richard s dale was a typical fox-hunting english squire a good many years older than his beautiful wife of whom he was intensely proud he and paul got on very well together though they had nothing in common save their mutual respect and admiration as for little dick he at once began to adore paul and appointed his tutor his final court of appeal in all things and paul grew very fond of dick and was a better man for it i suppose dick will go into the army when he grows up said paul to lady estale one day i suppose so if he can get through those silly tiresome examinations and if he does i do hope he'll go into a regiment where there is a pretty uniform a blue one would be best for him with his red hair i don't like scarlet with red hair do you mr seaton lady estale had mastered paul's name by this time paul laughed i don't think it matters to a man what colour his clothes are don't you no do you oh yes dreadfully i always adore to see men in dark blue think how nice a blue serge morning suit looks on a man and how sweet sailors always are 
of course a pink coat looks jolly for hunting but i don't like red uniforms half as well as blue ones especially for fair hair lady estale's way of looking at life was a source of never-ending amusement to paul she always seemed to be gazing at the world through the wrong end of a telescope and paul was not as severe on frivolity as he had been in the days when he so ruthlessly passed sentence on alice he was becoming more a man of the world and consequently more sympathetic with and tender towards human nature for life teaches a man more than all the universities rolled in one i've just had such a fright lady estelle confided to her son's tutor when the latter had been about a year at estelle what is the matter can i assist in any way asked paul who was the help of the family in all difficulties from the writing of french menus to the letting of cats out of traps i was afraid isabel carnaby was coming to live with us but who is isabel carnaby i fear i cannot gauge the extent of your anxiety till i know who the lady is oh i thought everybody knew isabel she is my husband's niece he had two sisters lady farley and mrs carnaby isabel was the carnaby's only child and mrs carnaby died when she was born it was a pity mrs carnaby died she had such lovely blue eyes and such a knack of knowing what suited her she was the best-dressed woman i ever met and major carnaby was devoted to her is major carnaby dead asked paul yes he died out in india while isabel was still a child and she has lived with the farleys ever since she is fairly well off and her father left word in his will that when she was of age she must decide whether to live with the farleys or with us as both sir benjamin and my husband were ready to take her for her mother's sake she has just come of age and i was dreadfully afraid she would decide to come to us and you wouldn't have liked it no i hate girls of that age they always say you are getting stout and that your hair isn't all your own paul concealed a smile did she give the apple to sir benjamin he inquired yes to my great relief sir benjamin has got a governorship out in india so isabel has chosen to go on living with them she is just the sort of girl to like being with excellencies and all that sort of thing what is miss carnaby like is she pretty oh no not pretty but smart and stylish and knows how to put her clothes on and she is dreadfully clever she positively terrified me the last time she was over in england what sort of cleverness does she write books asked paul who was always interested in literary ventures good gracious no not so bad as that replied lady estale looking shocked but she reads a good deal and says sharp things and you never know whether she is laughing at you or not she makes me quite nervous i don't like that sort of sharpness especially in a woman no more do i and then isabel is so abominably vain and i don't see anything to be conceited about in mere cleverness do you it isn't as if she were pretty still even clever people are sometimes conceited lady estale oh of course cleverness in a man is awfully nice and quite a thing to be conceited about owned her ladyship graciously i can't tell you how much my husband and i admire your cleverness nor how thankful we are for dick to have the advantage of it but i don't think it is quite the thing for a girl do you prettiness is so much more important i suppose beauty is the best gift for a woman to possess said paul but there are clever women and clever women and miss carnaby seems from your description to be exactly the sort of clever woman that i specially detest lady estale shook her head men don't generally detest her she confessed she is a man's woman out and out and she is a woman's woman too she added she really can make herself awfully pleasant if she likes and she has a wonderful knack of getting on with anybody she is simply splendid if you have got a lot of dull people in hand there is nobody she cannot talk to i believe if she met the man in the moon she would find out that he and she had a lot of mutual acquaintances even if they weren't related to one another then she has her good points yes it seems to me that the great question everybody is asking everybody else is do you know the so-and-sos if you do know them the conversation flourishes and if you don't it drops the so-and-sos are really far more important as a conversational opening than the weather i always think it rather bourgeois to talk about the weather don't you 
it certainly is a hackneyed subject owned paul well isabel invariably does know the so-and-sos and therefore socially she is a success take her to the dreariest tea-party and in five minutes there is a buzz of conversation then she is popular i presume and therefore spoiled i don't generally like what are termed popular people i am afraid to a certain extent she is popular said lady estale grudgingly that is to say she has always crowds of men fluttering round her sir richard expects that she will make a brilliant marriage out in india but i'm not so sure the clever women may get the most partners but it is the handsome ones that make the best matches well anyway i'm very glad she is not coming here oh i dare say you'd have got on with her all right you and she could have talked about books and things don't you know paul smiled but there are other things to be talked about besides books lady estale yes but some people find books awfully interesting i should myself if they didn't always send me to sleep before i had properly got into them and paul smiled again so isabel carnaby did not come to estale court just then and paul went on with his teaching of dick and made wonderful progress considering the raw material out of which he was expected to manufacture a scholar he also tried his hand at literature and earned an additional hundred a year by his contributions to magazines whereby life at the cottage at chaford was made considerably easier than it would otherwise have been at chaford things went on much the same as usual edgar continued to woo alice in silence and consequently in vain but he comforted himself by the idea that as she grew older and found how false and fickle the world is she would learn the value of one faithful heart that would never fail her however unworthy she might prove herself to be as for her her mind was still full of thoughts of paul he was not on the spot it is true as edgar was but he came home every holidays and it takes an exceptionally clever woman to forget a man in three months even when she has another man to help her End of chapter six chapter seven of concerning isabel carnaby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org concerning isabel carnaby by ellen thornycroft fowler chapter seven isabel carnaby the little blind god as he softly trod did a dart for his bow prepare and he sharpened it with a woman's wit and he feathered it with her hair when paul had been four years at esdale court and dick was considered nearly ready for eton the farley's term of indian governorship came to an end and they returned to england bringing their niece with them as lady esdale had predicted isabel had failed to make a brilliant marriage out in india but whether that were her fault or her misfortune isabel alone with the exception of two or three young officers who were still too sore to refer to the subject could say to paul's horror the anglo-indian trio came to stay at esdale and he was appointed to take miss carnaby in to dinner on the night of her arrival he disliked all he had heard of the girl and he made up his mind to snub her as much as was compatible with good manners and not to allow her to fall into the error of imagining for one moment that he would ever be dragged captive at her chariot wheels the farley party had arrived only just in time to dress and the drawing-room was already half full of county magnates and their attendant wives when sir benjamin and his two ladies came in sir benjamin was short and stout and her ladyship was tall and thin she evidently possessed the remains of striking beauty which he as evidently did not isabel followed them with an air of perfect assurance that somehow irritated paul she really was not good-looking enough to give herself such airs he thought for he was as yet too unlearned to know that her gown 
was fresh from paris and was the very acme of the prevailing fashion let me present you to miss carnaby said lady estelle's voice isabel this is mr seaton who will take you in to dinner paul prepared himself to meet a fellow greek and to return miss carnaby's bow as superciliously as she made it but he was completely taken aback when she held out a friendly little ungloved hand saying i'm so awfully pleased to meet you mr seaton dick tells me that you can blow birds eggs better than any man he knows and a past master in any art is always interesting to me it is very kind of you to say so miss carnaby paul was still a little stiff he certainly had some excuse for feeling annoyed he had armed himself to rebuff airs and graces and here was the most natural girl he had ever met in his life he felt that even joanna and alice would seem affected beside her she was so perfectly at her ease i'm so glad you are taking me in to dinner she continued as the whole party trooped dining roomwards all the other men in the room are so old and i'm dreadfully tired of going in to dinner with my extreme seniors would you believe it one week since we came home the united ages of the men who took me in to dinner amounted to three hundred i looked in debrett and added them up paul thawed sufficiently to smile that was rather rough on you it was simply unbearable they would explain things to me and try to instruct me and they ran to anecdotes and statistics at the slightest provocation one told me of all the reductions in rent he'd made to his tenants during the last twenty years and another gave me such an exhaustive description of every attack of gout he'd ever suffered that i could write a biography of that man's big toe nevertheless i hope you showed a teachable spirit in listening to them oh yes i didn't really listen but i kept counting a hundred and then saying how very interesting and then counting another hundred and saying it again you can't think what a good idea it was it was like my aunt's plan of counting imaginary geese to send yourself to sleep which by the way always keeps me awake the whole night i know my mother favours that plan too but she always calls them sheep she makes them go through a gate she says i tried it once but my gate kept swinging to and squeezing the sheep till i was quite wild with anxiety and consequently more wakeful than ever isabel laughed but i punished my last old gentleman she said what did you do when i found that my partner for saturday's dinner was older than any of his predecessors my usually amiable spirit rebelled and what form did the rebellion take i discovered that by breathing hard when my old gentleman wasn't looking i could make the candle shade in front of us catch fire whenever i liked so when there came any course that he was particularly keen on i blew with my mouth and the shade blazed my poor partner had to save the women and children by extinguishing the fire and while he was engaged in this act of heroism the footman thinking he had finished removed his plate and he saw its dainties no more paul laughed outright have you ever noticed asked isabel as the plates were being changed that the bit of toast underneath a hors d'oeuvre which mark you is appointed to be cut by a little silver fork is always of a consistency which would defy a steam hammer is it invariably and therefore the little silver fork is usually bent or broken while the piece of toast springs unscratched into the air and lands upon the carpet you speak feelingly said paul i have learnt in suffering what i teach in ordinary conversation the fish fork is also a source of much distress to me how is that it never strikes me as an instrument of destruction well you see it is in this way explained miss carnaby some people have fish forks as well as fish knives sort of half-bred dessert forks don't you know with ivory handles now we don't have these at home we use ordinary silver forks so i am not prepared for them i see they take you unawares precisely the consequence is i use a common fork for my fish and then when i get to the second entree my sin finds me out and i am left with nothing on my hands but a large knife and this nasty little half-cast dessert fork whatever do you do asked the amused paul i fling myself upon the mercy of the man who has taken me in and i confess i have never found my confidence misplaced 
he invariably gives me his own silver fork and if he is a brave man asks one of the footmen for another for himself but if he is only of a normal courage he eats his own entree with my fish fork in shame and confusion of face you might write a book on the sorrows of dining suggested paul so i could at least you and i could do it together paul could not help feeling flattered though he tried his hardest not i should describe what i have suffered at the hands of an undermined jelly he said don't you know the horrid insinuating way the thing has of curtsying to you and when you respond to its inviting attitude of flinging itself bodily upon your neck and burying yourself and it in the common ruins isabel laughed with delight i know exactly and another evil and bitter thing is helping oneself to strawberries when they are in a pyramid you mean said paul yes and the strawberry at the apex of the pyramid suffers from suicidal tendencies and is prone to hurl itself from its giddy height to perdition if you so much as breathe paul laughed and its path to destruction added miss carnaby leaves a lurid crimson stain right across the hostess's tablecloth like tennyson's maud said paul when her feet had touched the meadows and left the daisies rosy isabel smiled what an apt quotation paul looked pleased i think our treatise upon the sorrows of dining promises to be a success he said what a pretty girl violet has grown remarked isabel looking down the table at her cousin yes and so like her mother agreed paul is she in love with anybody yet do you think now paul had a strong suspicion that a certain lord robert thistletown and violet were by no means indifferent to each other but he was not going to gossip about the esdales even to isabel so he said discreetly i'm sure i can't say she would not be very likely to confide in me even if she were i suppose not but an author like you ought to discover love stories without having to be told them like some people discover water by means of hazel twigs paul smiled i am not an author yet he said but joking apart you really write a good deal don't you mr seaton uncle richard tells me that the delightful and fascinating short story signed p s which one comes across now and again in various magazines are yours they are certainly mine miss carnaby but i am afraid that their delightfulness and fascination exist only in your rose-coloured imagination don't be foolish every one thinks they are splendid you must know you are clever and i call it affectation for people to pretend they don't recognize their own good points now i for instance never pretend that i'm not clever if i'd had my choice i'd rather have been pretty i confess but that is neither here nor there it would be useless for you to pretend that you are not clever nobody would be taken in clever as you are you would not be clever enough for that you don't know how clever i am said isabel i once succeeded in making a man think i was not clever and what effect did the delusion have upon him he fell in love with me on the spot still he might have done that even if he'd known you were clever suggested paul there is no limit i believe to the folly of the heart of man in affairs of this kind i dare say he knew you were clever all the time and was only a deceiver ever when he pretended he thought you were not men will forgive even cleverness in a woman they really care for you have no idea how weak they are as long as the woman is not cleverer than they are themselves i suppose of course that goes without saying besides no man is so supernaturally humble as to believe that the cleverest woman in the world is quite as clever as he is himself he only knows that she is cleverer than all his friends if ever i think a man is in danger of thinking me too clever said isabel meditatively i always ask him how to spell a word any word will do provided it is not too difficult for him you can't think how it at once restores the equilibrium between the sexes and if in addition to spelling the word he can give you its derivation both the man and the scholar stand for ever vindicated that's a good plan said paul a very good plan now that you mention it i notice i have often felt distinct pleasure when a woman has asked me how to spell a word and the pleasure has risen to pure joy when i have superadded the derivation but you are wandering from the point said isabel reprovingly i was saying how i liked your stories and you were saying that you weren't really clever excuse me miss carnaby you are inaccurate what i said or intended to say was that i thought i was so clever that i ought to do something better than write such stories as those 
humility is not one of my many virtues as you will perceive as you come to know me better it isn't one of mine either no i'd already perceived that though i've only known you for half an hour isabel laughed you are very candid candor has a place i am glad to say in my repertoire of excellencies i derive much pleasure from the exercise of it myself and as no one takes any notice of my opinion it really doesn't do any harm i suppose you feel you ought to write a big book instead of sticking to short stories i should like to write a big book replied paul well i am sure you can and therefore i am sure you will paul looked at the speaker appreciatively it is true that if a man can write a book he will do it sooner or later but how did you come to know a thing like that i can't tell i knew it of myself without being told i always say that writing is like flirting if you can't do it nobody can teach you to do it and if you can do it nobody can keep you from doing it paul smiled you are quite right if i don't write a book it will prove that i can't write a book but all the same i hope and believe i can i'm afraid i must talk a bit to the man on my other side said isabel i don't want to but he keeps clearing his throat like a clock that is going to strike and i cannot any longer disregard the sign i suppose i also ought to exchange pleasure for duty and endeavour to converse with the old lady on my left you ought to change lou lamps for old you mean suggested isabel allow me to express a hope that the old one will be as brilliant as the new it is unwise to hope for impossibilities and generally leads to disappointment replied paul after paul and isabel had duly fulfilled their duty to their neighbours isabel said you mustn't be in too great a hurry to begin your book experience as well as genius is required for the writing of books that is very true and that is why i am waiting i don't want to seem conceited but i am speaking candidly to you now and i feel and know i have the power to write what would be worth reading but where i am weak is in the experience of life i've always lived in a small world and small worlds though perhaps the most comfortable places of residence are not good training grounds or seminaries of learning my experience is that small worlds and big worlds are pretty much alike replied isabel i've lived in both and i don't see much difference i don't mean that small worlds are really less interesting than big ones human nature is of course the same in both and it is human nature that is the most interesting thing in life as you say the deeper things are the same in small worlds as in great ones but their outer aspects differ in different cases and the more cases one sees the wider are one's sympathies but seeing a lot of people is not knowing them objected isabel we are all more or less like the man in the iron mask and take abundant pains to hide our real faces from our fellows which we have no right to do in my opinion we are not bound to lay our souls bare for every one to look at but as much as we do show ought to be part of our real selves and not a mask to put people off the scent it seems to me that to take the trouble to conceal ourselves argues an exaggerated idea of our own importance which reminds me said isabel of a funny old man we once met at a table d'hote he told us in strict confidence that he was the mayor of little pettifog but begged us not to mention it again as he was travelling incog paul laughed a most happy instance it seems to me that there are a good many mares of little pettifog travelling incog don't you think so yes i do and like you i have no patience with them but on the other hand said paul i think it is as a rule our own fault if people behave like the man in the iron mask with us and proves that we are the same don't you think that the world is a very fair mirror and that people treat us very much as we treat them certainly and if you are single-minded towards your friends and think more of what is due to them than to you they in turn will be single-minded towards you and think more of what is due to you than to themselves at least that has been my experience so far and mine too and in the same way if you are time-serving you will find other people the same added isabel of course when we are very young we are anxious that other people should adequately love and fulfil their duty to us while well, as we grow older we realize that that is their part of the business not ours and that what we have to do is to adequately love and fulfil our duty to them this is merely a question of growth and the development of a sense of proportion 
i believe in human nature as a whole i have trusted a good many people more or less and none of them as yet have ever failed me isabel said and never will as long as you trust them added paul but only when you begin to doubt them i quite agree with you there again i do not a bit mind being laughed at in fact if the joke is a good one i am ready to join in it so i generally show my real self to people and am not afraid of what is called giving myself away consequently people as a rule show their real selves to me it is a great mistake to be afraid of giving oneself away i don't know a more paralyzing form of fear it seems to me replied isabel that life is very much like swimming or skating one has to let oneself go before one can get on at all and we have all got to be ourselves the best possible edition of ourselves i admit but still ourselves and not anybody else and therefore we must expand along our own lines and not along other people's do you remember the duchess's baby in alice in wonderland who made a very ugly baby but a very handsome pig now so many people are like that they make stupendous efforts to become ugly babies instead of settling down comfortably as handsome pigs milton satan was wiser in his generation than the children of light remarked paul he preferred ruling as a handsome pig to serving as an ugly baby if you remember only he put the case in more forceful words still the sentiment is the same but he was not supposed to take the highest view but wouldn't you rather be the ruling pig than the serving baby asked isabel i'm afraid i would but that doesn't make it right still you said just now that we must be ourselves and not anybody else and i say so still miss carnaby but one must not press the rule too far we must of course live our own lives and cultivate our own characters and must not try to grow roses on apple trees nor lilies on oaks but our healthy desire for individuality must not carry us into the error of becoming a law unto ourselves and doing whatsoever is right in our own eyes i think i see what you mean i speak from experience continued paul as i told you i was brought up in a narrow world and also in a very religious one and i was taught that few things were right and that many things were wrong and that we must all try and conform ourselves to the same pattern as i grew older and saw more of the world i found that this view of life was too narrow a one and then i joined in the modern worship of individuality and the glorification of humanity and i abused all law and order because they tended to cramp and conform the individual now a second reaction has set in and i see that the truth lies halfway between the two extremes as in fact it generally does isabel's eyes glistened paul interested her extremely then you mean that one must be the master of one's individuality and not its slave she said or in better words as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness answered paul you see the highest life is a life of contradictions and this is merely one of them tell me about your own people said isabel impulsively i'm sure they must be nice and paul to his surprise found himself telling miss carnaby all about his father and his mother and joanna and his life at oxford and his boating and his struggle to get on and his dreams of fame and isabel seemed to understand it all as thoroughly as he did himself paul had never talked so well in his life before he admired miss carnaby enough to desire above all things to make a good impression on her and he was not yet sufficiently in love with her to be awkward and tongue-tied in her presence when a man admires without loving he is conversationally at his best there comes a later stage when he utters banalities and makes inane jokes and inwardly curses himself for appearing such an ass in the sight of the prettiest eyes in the world and he has no idea that the prettiest eyes in the world see through a stone wall as far as most people and very much prefer this style of conversation to rounded sentences and finished periods as paul sat smoking in his own room that night he said to himself i never saw a woman with such blue eyes in my life which was not true he had seen scores of women with equally blue eyes but he had never taken the trouble to notice them 
then he mused his thoughts still running on isabel think of calling such a girl as that vain she isn't a bit vain it is the other women that are so beastly jealous of her which also was not true isabel was extremely vain and paul had already done his best to make her more so but his eyes were blinded that he could not see End of chapter seven